Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending upon where you're connecting from. My name is Bart Johnson, and welcome to the Flipped IRS PBL uh, 2021 series of, of webinars. Uh, for the session, we were just talking about the corona or COVID environment that we're all working in, and uh, certainly that's affected this uh, conference, but excited to have another uh, series here today. I'll be moderating this session. Uh, this session is entitled Innovation in the Role of the Teacher, Ways of Doing PBL. And we're gonna have two presentations in this format. They'll be about three to four or so minutes each. And then when those presentations are done, we'll have the uh, presenters maybe make a few more comments and then we'll go into a period of questions and answers. And as Ida just mentioned, this session is being recorded, just making sure everyone is aware of that. And so this um, session is really focused on the implementation of PBL to a course or a semester, and just recognizing that when we do that, there's a new pedagogical approach that's needed, uh, needs to be implemented. And that implementation both involves the students and the teachers or faculty. And there, there's, that's important to recognize that the implementation takes part for both. This, is, this session elaborates on the experiences and difficulties uh, that these two groups presenters have experienced while implementing PBL, as well as when uh, developing the, their different approaches as they've developed their practices. Um, so the one is on the introductory course in engineering mechanics at Alborg University and in Copenhagen. And then the other is on a training of trainers program from Africa using the jigsaw class approach and excited to hear from both of our present, uh, groups that are presenting today. So with that, let's go to the first presentation. The title is A Problem-Based Approach to Teaching a Course in Engineering Mechanics. And today it's being presented by Imad Abu Hat, uh, who is at Alborg University right now. So if, Imad, if you'd like to begin your presentation. Yes, thank you. I hope you all can see my screen now. Yes, uh, yes, I have I have written an article with uh, my supervisor uh, Bettina and my uh, sub, uh, supplementary supervisor uh, Camila. Bettina is uh, is here, so she can help us in answering the questions. So the whole idea is how to implement PBL in a course and not just in a project. That is how to implement uh, PBL uh, Albert model in a course so that they have the same fairly uh, common pedagogy. So, so this is an introduction to the PBL. It is a student-centered pedagogy. It starts with a problem, which is a real life problem or an authentic problem. Uh, and the students learn by constructing their knowledge. So the main questions are, how can the Alberg model itself be transferred to my courses themselves? What are the merits and the issues of implementing PBL in the courses that should support the semester projects according to the Albert model itself. So the study uh, is around 42 first semester students enrolled in the engineering study program, sustainable design. And uh, we have implemented PBL in the autumn 2017 and in 2018. And I have used the following qualitative research methods and structured group interviews, participant observations, and the student reports, and of course, and finally the course evaluations. So the course project uh, is really similar to the student's own semester project, because I want to connect the course to the semester project. The semester project was on construction of the equipment to a playing ground for the children. So I choose my part in the course so that it would be similar to that. A girl on the swing is one part, a chandelier in a room and a boy in a spring course. So the whole course will be based on these three problems. The whole topics of the course will be based on these problems. So I started myself by introducing statics and uh, etc. by using an example like this, which is similar to the girl on a swing. And then this pedagogy I choose from the beginning is discussion in the classroom, which is led by the teacher. And then, and then they should work alone on their projects here. So at the end of the discussions, of course, we come up with the, what I want to do in the course, equation of equilibrium, 
moments equal to zero, forces equal to zero, like this. And here is an example of the student's own solution. This is the first part of the project, and they draw forces, and this is what they also have done uh, in the first part of the project. So uh, the results are a little bit better than before. In 2015 and 16, it was just lectures, this course. It is only 17 and 18, and now it is PBL uh, implemented in the course. But before that, it was just usual lectures as we know them from big universities, et cetera, et cetera. No project, nothing. So uh, I have assembled a group reports here on Moodle, and here are my uh, comparisons of the evaluations. Here I have 2017 and 18, where you have implementation of PBL. The years before, no implementation. And this is the results of the student uh, uh, measure of satisfaction, right? And we can, we, can, we can clearly see that there is a little bit of improvement in their uh, understanding and, uh, and their satisfaction uh, with the course uh, like this. And then what, is, what are my remarks here? What is the problem is I, I think that I want to bridge the gap between the semester projects, which is part of the Albert model, and the courses themselves. And I want to have a common PBL pedagogy and not just different pedagogies for the courses and some pedagogy, which is PBL for the projects. I want the students to be in one word, the PBL word, in the whole of Alborg University. But what are its advantages? PBL design takes much more time from the teacher part than that allocated for the course. I mean, it's not just like I prepare lesson one, lesson two, et cetera, et cetera. It should be designed from the beginning. It takes so much time than usual preparation time. And if you want to be better in the course, you should take care that they are not homogeneous. You have to you have to step in as a group supervisor. You have to change your tactics in the way because the students differ in skills and knowledge, and some of them really need strong guidance to, to learn. So just you just can't force one model on them. You have to be uh, like uh, diverse in your in your teaching when you implement PBL. This is what I am uh, having uh, very quick. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Maud. We'll uh, we'll go to our next presentation. I, I do have a few questions, but we will save those for the uh, the question and answer period. Our our second uh, presentation here is a study of student centered learning approach applied uh, in the training of trainers in Africa. And yep, and we have our next presenter here. And I lost my name list here real quick, but Miriam, Miriam, I don't remember your last is Ismail. If I'm saying that correctly, we'll be presenting for this this group. So, Miriam, if you yeah. want to take it from there, and Ida will be doing the slides for you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Greetings from Zanzibar. Our presentation will be on Jigsaw Classroom Student Centered Learning Approach Applied in the Training of Trainers in Africa. This is a collaborative research. It's a result of collaborative research. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, our presentation will be focusing on five areas. We will be talking about our project. And then uh, next, we'll be talking about this modified Jigsaw Classroom. And also, I will just pose a kind of discussion and little recommendation. And then I'll pose a question for the audience to to, I mean, to kind of reflect and uh, come up with a discussion. Now, what is this ACEA project? This is enhancing entrepreneurship innovation and sustainability in higher education in, in, in Africa. That's why we call it ACEA project. Actually, there are our partners, uh, as I have said, this is a collaborative project, like an international project between EU, uh, universities and African university, actually about 10. Uh, when I say five African and five European university, so there is in, in European, Alborg University, or University of Copenhagen, Roskilde, Royal Institute, and then Catalonia in Spain. And in Africa, Kamwe Nkrumah, University of Energy and Natural Resources, Sokoine University in Tanzania, 
uh, Kilimanjaro, uh, KCMCU in Tanzania and State University of Zanzibar. Our main aim was to transform the way we teach in higher education. So we wanted to initiate sustained educational change in higher education in Africa. And the output was like coming up with the five best practices by redesigning our curriculum and integrating the entrepreneurship component, innovation component, sustainability component in our curriculum, curriculum and then deliver, um, um, I mean, using methods like a student-centered learning approaches, including um, um, uh, blended learning or e-learning. So the main activity which we have been doing for all that timing was uh, we, we have to start with the training of trainers. Actually, when we say trainers, this university lecturer to come up with the, like to redesign their curriculum and try to integrate all of these things. And uh, uh, the rationale of this was like, we wanted to, in, to work together, increasing commitment and collaboration. Next slide, please. So the approach, actually the approach we used by doing this training of trainer, we, we, we used Jigsaw Classroom, but then we had to modify it based on our, uh, on our project. As we know that um, Jigsaw, uh, Jigsaw Classroom is a highly structured cooperative learning and collaborative learning. So we kind of modified it. Uh, we, we had home group by having two African experts from each, each five university from Africa. And then we had two workshop in EU country. We went to Alborg and then we also went to Sweden. Uh, and then we had face to face, we had facilitators from European countries, we had workshop together. And then uh, we had workshop in Africa, they come to Africa and then we had a workshop together. And also they offer us consultancy by having support team from EU countries. And also actually initially when we started before we traveled to Europe, we started learning through blended learning, but there are, there are materials online and we, we had some assignments, we study, we, we responded to questions and then um, as part of uh, training. Next slide. And uh, here is something for discussion. When we introduced this uh, jigsaw, um, jigsaw things, it was kind of something which was not familiar. And then, so it moved from not being familiar to something which uh, trainers have to apply in their own teaching. But also we, we, we work jointly between African University and European University uh, through collaboration and also our collaboration increased. Actually, since the start of the project, we worked collaboratively to discuss, to, to be mentored and to come up with different things. So actually we recommend that um, uh, this is an indication that uh, if you modify this uh, jigsaw, um, uh, jigsaw thing, um, actually there are, is increased commitment and collaboration. Uh, the next slide. And here is the question I want to pose for the group to discuss. Uh, to which extent are student-centered learning approaches, for example, such as the Jigsaw Classroom or PBL, culturally, cultural, uh, culturally accepted in African university? Because uh, you have to know that in Africa, we have classes, overloaded classrooms with many students. And actually many people were used to chalk and talk and then when you introduce this new jigsaw classroom, whereby it require collaboration and cooperation, it was kind of something new. So this is what I want to pose to you, like uh, to what extent, extent this, is, this can be culturally accepted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam, for that, that presentation. Um, and I guess, if, if we can, I think what we'll do is, uh, Ida, if you bring uh, her PowerPoint back up. And uh, I know some of us will have questions and things we, we'd like to maybe ask, but I, I would like to start maybe with just a little dialogue on your question. If you, so Ida, if you can bring up her last, last slide. Yes. Can you see it now? Yep. So let's let's just start there a little bit. Um, I don't know, Mary, or any, if you want to introduce your other 
um, collaborators in this project too, they might be part of helping to ask this, you know, ask this question and, and respond to it. Uh, so why don't you take a, just a brief moment there to introduce your, your collaborators on this project. Okay, my collaborator today online is only Mona, I think. Mona, are you there? Mona. Yes, I just need to unmute my mic. Yes, I'm here. Uh, but actually, there's another one of our collaborators also here. I've seen Henrik online, who is one of the collaborators from University of Copenhagen. So we are three. Okay. I haven't seen neither Anthony nor Al. Uh, yeah. Anthony or oh, Alsa is not here. Yeah, no. Henry, can you, uh, Mona, have you have introduced yourself, right? Henry, yeah. can you introduce yourself, please? Oh. Henrik, we can't hear you. It doesn't look like you're on mute, but we don't hear you. It is here. So now you can hear me, I'm sure. Uh, I'm also yeah. in this project. I'm, uh, I'm there for um, introducing or focusing on e-learning. I'm an e-learning uh, consultant at the University of Copenhagen. So that's my main topic in this project. Okay. So Marion, where would you like to, to go with this question? Is there something you'd like specific that we as a group could discuss with you or further uh, develop this question? Yeah, you can, yeah, whatever, you can uh, further discuss it. Uh, as I have said, we are coming from a, you know, like a, uh, most teachers in Africa have learned a number of pedagogical, like um, uh, pedagogy, but normally because of a number of students and the environment we have actually, most people will resort to chalk and talk because it is the easiest, or they will go for lecture because it is the easiest one and they will prefer to give uh, maybe question to take home. Or even if they are going to give group work, it will be like the, the lecturer will give group work and then the lecturer will, sit, will just sit aside uh, waiting for the student to respond rather than also uh, is a lecturer being part of the, um, of, the, of the group and discuss together with the student. So as I said, this is something which is culturally and normally uh, teacher educators and student teachers, normally you do what, your teacher used to do. So this has been a long, like uh, it has got its roots. Like this is something which uh, since I started uh, about teaching, I've seen my teacher using chalk and talk. And sometimes they introduce other method, but um, like a, not really like um, putting much emphasis on those. And because they take time, you need to prepare and organize yourself. So people end up uh, with chalk and talk and maybe introduce. So when um, when Jigsaw Classroom came in, as uh, the previous speaker talked about PBL also, it's actually taxing. And sometimes you need to move from being uncomfortable to, to another zone. So that's why we, we, we put that question. Okay. So Miriam, there's a question here in the chat um, and asking, what do you mean by culturally? And could there be also be practical reasons for, for not doing this. Well, shall I may be yeah. given an attempt to answer, uh, Maryam? Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's definitely true, Bettina. I, I, I didn't actually introduce myself. I think that a lot, a lot of you know that I, I'm former employee of the UNESCO Center for Problem-Based Learning. So I have been, learning, uh, been working with problem-based learning for many, many years. And over the last, uh, almost 10 years, specifically in Africa. Uh, and of course, the UNESCO Center has the mission to spread the happy message of problem-based learning throughout the world. But I also think that sometimes we'd have to stop and, and reflect whether PBL is a universal way of learning and whether it can actually be implemented anywhere in the world without problems. And you're perfectly right, Bettina. Yes, there definitely are practical reasons why it can be difficult. If you, ha if you have a class of a thousand first year students, uh, the, the number of six, seven person students you'd have to make is daunting. So there can be practical problems about problem-based learning. Uh, but what, what we mean by culturally is more to which extent does the approach, the underlying uh, 
principles, the philosophy behind problem-based learning, to which extent does it actually align with, shall we say, traditional uh, African ways of teaching and learning? Um, and for in, in, in order to answer that question, of course, it would have been wonderful if there had been some more, some more Africans around. Uh, yeah. May I ask so, a follow-up? Does, oh, yeah. does that answer your question about what we mean by culture? Yes, but I was also thinking that, I mean, Africa, I mean, like, just if you look at Europe, I mean, there's a huge difference from, let's say, Denmark to Hungary and to Spain. I don't know if we say African, is that, that like one unit? I mean, I would expect that there are big differences in culture and I'm also, I mean, with culture, it could also be, I mean, I don't know how you, is, are you allowed to, I mean, talk back to your teacher or is it going, I mean, if you criticize or discuss, is that perceived as being critique of the teacher and how, I think maybe that's part of the, what you're saying that it could be culturally difficult or, or, or something, I don't know. But yeah, I, that was, I, I think that was two questions in one, that's not a. <laughs> yeah. No, but of course you're perfectly right that Africa is 53 or 55 different nations. I'm not hundred percent sure about the number. And there are huge differences, even within some of the nations, there are huge differences uh, among ethnic groups. I mean, you have very, very, a very, very larger degree of diversity in Africa than you have in, in, in European countries in general. But um, yeah, so. Can I, can, I, can I ask a question, if I, if I might? Yes, please, please do. I mean, what's so special about African higher education for example, PBL itself is a culture that, uh, that should be learned by students all over the world, also in Latin America, also in, the, in Europe, also in, uh, in the US. So it's, it's, PBL itself is a new culture uh, that to be learned. And I can't understand why we should differentiate between African higher education and Latin American higher education when we implement PBL because all of those students were accustomed to traditional teaching. Even in Europe, there are also universities that don't have PBL, even in the US. So I think that, I think that this, uh, this uh, breakthrough is, is new for anyone, regardless of the, of the culture, because PBL is a new thing uh, to be adopted uh, to. So, so, so maybe we should have more, uh, more uh, research on on what, is our, what are the characteristics of African higher education rather, rather than if PBL is accepted because PBL is not accepted over all the whole Europe, for example, not even the whole U in the United States or in Latin America. So you have the same problem there. So what's special about this question? You're perfectly right, <laughs> uh, Imad. The, the, uh, PBL is not, is not uh, uh, spread over the whole world yet. Uh, the only reason why we put Africa in here is because, well, I could have said, is it universally acceptable? Is problem-based learning universally acceptable independent of the cultural background? Uh, that would have sort of included the whole universe. Uh, that the reason why we put Africa here is because our project specifically focuses on introducing problem-based learning in Africa. So that's actually the only reason why it's, it's, it's mentioned here. There was another chat question now just popped up. Well, there's a, a couple of comments here based to individuals' experiences. And uh, so just looking at those here, I think maybe a, a question could be to, to this, this group. I'm looking at motivation for both the, the teachers, instructors, and for the students. And could you comment in, in this experience here how, where was the, the, the trainer or teacher motivation at? Where was this something that, or how did you develop their motivation and interest for this? And have you used it with students yet? And how was their motivation developed for, for the PBL or Jigsaw approach? The uh, motivation of, of teachers, the ones who were the trainees, so to speak, in this training of trainers program, uh, and the, as, as Mariam rightly said, the university lecturers from the five African universities, 
by far the majority of them had already been part of another Danita funded project that dealt with only problem based learning and e learning, not with the entrepreneurship, innovation, and sustainability. So they were already, so to speak, in a close collaboration with Henrik and myself, first and foremost, and the Roskilde University was there too in that Danita project. Uh, so they were motivated and they were actually themselves part of the meeting where we decided that we want to take this project and project results further than where we are today. In the Danita project, we would be doing mainly what uh, uh, Imad has been telling us about, doing uh, PPL in courses, but not the cross-disciplinary type of, of semester projects that we do at AAU. So we decided that we try that as the next step, and that's what we've been doing. That is to actually try to introduce uh, in the uh, African universities a model somewhat similar to the old uh, PBL model that we used to have in Aalborg uh, University, where we had more courses than just the three. Um, and, and teachers were highly motivated for that. And uh, to the question about students, uh, students have been involved in the curriculum redesign in the five African universities. Those students who had previous knowledge from the particular curriculum which had been chosen to be redesigned. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, no, none of the five universities have started actually teaching yet. So therefore the students have not yet been, shall we say, exposed to project work, problem-based learning, student-centered learning. Uh, in to the extent that that will happen when the uh, curriculum are, are fully finished. Okay, uh, we still have time for questions. Uh, at the half hour mark, we'll transition back to the first presentation of some questions. Yeah, but that still gives us about four minutes here. So like, either in the uh, chat or verbally. Yeah. Yep. I would like to add something just quickly. Uh, uh, me, like uh, from African University, like um, I'm from the School of Education. Actually, we have been, we are training teachers, uh, those who are going to schools in pri uh, primary school, pre-primary schools, and secondary school to teach. So actually, there is a lot of complaint that in schools, there are, is parrot learning, students are cramming, and actually they cannot relate to what they are learning with their everyday life because of the way we teach. So actually, this, this motivated us to join. When we joined in this program, we so much wanted to change the way teachers are teaching so that everyone will be learning. And when they go in schools, they change the way even school children are learning. Instead of cramming and do part of learning, they actually have to understand and do some kind of project and solve a problem and try to relate with everyday issues rather than uh, learning from the book and cramming and responding and the type of question they have because of paper, pencil test and so on. So that's also trigger us and motivate us to be in this uh, project. Okay, might ask, uh, we had a couple comments there, may I ask those individuals if they'd like to elaborate just a little bit. Because, uh, would you be one to, can elaborate on your comment? Sure. Um, we teach um, at TIER at the Barring Polytechnic University. And um, I was lucky enough to be a student there. And when I was a student, um, now a tutor myself, um, I was taught around PBL centered approach. So the transition for me as a tutor now is much easier um, because I was taught in a PBL centered learning, right? So now all I do as a tutor is basically design interesting and engaging scenarios that are actually related to real life scenarios. And that makes it very interesting for the students, especially first year students. Um, the level of engagement that I got from the first year students is pretty high um, when I made sure that the courses are just um, designed and jam packed with engageful scenarios. That's what worked for me personally. So um, if you give them a problem, um, they're just engaged um, straight away. That helped me personally around the course. And I, from the feedback as well that I got from other tutors, that was pretty good as well for them. So I, maybe that helps. Thank you. I, yep, I agree. Sorry. 
Mona, I saw you raised your hand. Did you want to respond to that? Yes, I actually did just because uh, you, you wrote in your comment, Kasim, that uh, the biggest challenge was to facilitate and teach first year students around the people approach because the students are highly dependent on traditional teaching methods in schools. And that is, of course, quite clear. It's one of the uh, observations that we have with the Asia project also that we somehow need to prepare students for being able to manage the teamwork, being able to manage the project timing and planning, etc., etc. And in my opinion, and, and as I said before, I have been with the UC people, I've been with Oldbrook University since before the university existed. And in all the many, many, many years, we have been teaching a first year study program, an introductory study program, where we give the students the tools for collaborating, the tools for project management. We tell them something about learning and why it is that we do this weird way of teaching rather than just lecturing chalk and chalk and talk, as Mariam said. And in my opinion, that first year study introductory course is quite uh, an important factor why Aalborg University has been successful. Because I mean, we can claim today that we have been successful in our approach. One of the reasons why I say that is because the other PBL university we have here in Denmark, which is in Roskilde, also a partner in our Asia project, they also do PBL and my own son went there and studied there. Whenever I was introduced, whenever I was preparing uh, slides for my, my study introductory course at Aalborg University, Rasmus, my son came and said, hey mom, can I have these slides? Because I need to know this too. And, and I think this idea of a study introductory course where you give students the basic skills and tools that they need to, to manage in a PBL learning environment, that's quite essential for success. So, so try to look more into that. Yep. Totally agree you. With you, so Deborah, did you want to elaborate on your comment? Sure. Go, go ahead. I, yep. Okay, fine. Um, I'm from a medical school background. Um, in our school, when we started PBL years ago in Asia, we thought Asian students can't do PBL uh, because of the traditional uh, learning. But we found that actually, if we have trained our medical tutors, our lecturers well in this aspect, so that they, so that they understand the philosophy behind PBL. And then we give similar training. We give hands-on training to our first year medical students right at the beginning before they start the PBL. Then when both sides understand that, it takes away the anxiety um, that, is, uh, that comes with something new. And we keep reassuring them that it's fine that you don't know the answers uh, right at the beginning. It takes away that anxiety and after that, they, they actually get on with it quite well. And we actually find that our students can adapt to it. It's not without difficulties. There will be some who will always be concerned what is the right answer? What is the right answer? They will always be asking that. Um, but we have to take care of the emotion aspect as well as the skills, like what uh, Mona mentioned. We, we need to give them the, the skills to scaffold them. Uh, but I feel the emotion part is important. And what's more, in our school, we not only train them to be PBL learner, we also try to train them to be student facilitators. And then when they get to clinical years, we also train them to write cases that would be uh, that can be used for PBL. So then by the time they graduate, like what Kwasin um, mentioned, they became they are PBL graduates. So some of our tutors now, they themselves have gone through the PBL process. They have gone, they understood the, the anxiety and the concerns that some of these students may face. And they they then are able to become a very good PBL facilitators. I find. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Did any of the presenters want to respond to that at all? Yeah, I, I do agree. I, I think it's the, both the skill set of how to be successful in a PBL environment, and then working very much with that emotional and the motivation part for students because. Students do want to be successful, and I think the more we can help them understand what we're looking for in success, um, 
because that idea of the right answer, I mean, how many years have students been trained that to, to do good work means that you've gotten the right answer. And I think that's an important element of any education at the higher, especially the higher ed level is getting beyond that, right? That there's always one right answer. And that's, I think Deborah, you've hit on something there that I think PBL uh, has the ability to really help affect the idea. It's not just about quote unquote, getting this right answer and getting a good mark and a good grade. There truly is uh, looking at the, the motivation behind the problem or the project being worked on and the outcome and what that means. So I, I think you, culturally, I think that's true in all of our cultures. Our students want to be successful. Uh, so thanks for that, that, that presentation. I think uh, it looks like Mona has a question and then we'll transition. No, not a question, it's just a, okay. a very last comment because I couldn't agree more to what you just said, Deborah. With with prepared students, with well-prepared students who knows what's expected from them to be a good student. And that's not necessarily the right answer, but probably maybe even uh, more the right question. And with well-prepared teachers, then PBL can succeed, but, but both parts needs to be prepared. I completely agree. Okay. So Ahmad, we'll, we'll kind of pivot back to you. I hope it was okay, we just rolled with, I thought they had the question. So it just seemed good to roll with that, but would like to come back and maybe um, if, if you could just also introduce your collaborators that are yes, here uh, yes. and then uh, maybe just elaborate on your presentation and kind of prompt the questioning again, and I'll try to help you to the best of my ability. Yes. My uh, collaborators are here. Actually, they are also my supervisors. Bettina Dahl is here and Camila is also here. Bettina is uh, at the university. Oh. Alborg and Bern in Norway, and Camila is at the University of Copenhagen Department of the Science Education. Yes. So what triggered me is that when I started teaching at Alborg University in Copenhagen, uh, my colleagues use classical teaching methods in their courses, and uh, it, it struck me as a head. Oh, why is that uh, not PBL as the Alborg model says it should be? And then I've read a lot about this album model, and then it's only on the projects, and uh, it's only written that the courses should support the project, and the students will be exposed to lecturing, uh, homework, seminars, etc. Regardless of what that means. So I said, okay, why not having a common pedagogy for the whole uh, semester, which I was involved in, so that the course is more integrated into their semester of projects, real integration, by choosing uh, problems that are very similar or coming from the same area. For example, at that time, they have to do a semester project on the design of equipments for children playing ground. So I just moved to you know, children in kindergarten, see if I can make a screenshots, camera, see what's, what's, uh, what's going on there. And then I, I decided to base the whole course uh, on just three mini projects. Uh, so that uh, so that I can uh, implement PBL uh, in that instead of just uh, starting traditionally as in the textbook uh, chapter one chapter two chapter three uh, etc. There uh, before that there was a lot of problems in 2015 16 before I came really uh, of that of that especially that course uh, because it, uh, the problem is that. The, there was no integration between the teachers in the course and the semester projects. The teachers uh, really came from Alborg, Alborg to teach that course. They came by helicopter, etc., etc., by hotel rooms, etc., and then they make uh, teaching like two weeks in a row, and then they go they go back to Alborg. We don't know anything about the project or anything about the student project, etc. So there was big problems there. Students uh, complain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they called me, of course, <laughs> me, <laughs> and said, okay, can you, can you do something about this uh, course here? So I started as just an external lecturer in that, in that course. And then I, I, I realized that the problem was more than, more than engaging, engaging with the students in their daily struggle with the semester project, and it should be coordinated with the semester project. I mean, they should know something before they can tackle the semester project itself. And that something was missing before. So I, uh, I made a lot of meetings with the semester coordinators to see what is that project about, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, 
I do the project and then I design the course so that it follows the project uh, in, the, in that case. So, so in, that, in that case, I, I feel that it's more faithful to the Alborg model itself that I am following, my course is following the semester project rather than just classical lecturing as it was before. And as it unfortunately still practice at Alborg University about the courses. So I said, why, why they should have two different words, the students, the word of lectures and the word of PBL in the projects. I mean, uh, why is that? Then I, I decided if I can connect the two words by PBL in the course. So this was the whole idea of implementing the PBL in that course. I hope I was clear. Yep. So Ahmad, there's a question here from Mona. Uh, just what was the topic of the semester project? And and yes. Any yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I may, if I can share my, can I share my screen a little bit? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, if you can see, the semester project is really about uh, design or redesign of equipment for children playground or in the kindergarten. For example, something like this, or something like this, or they should uh, design some uh, something to play with. So this is a semester project of the, of the student at the very, very first semester. And the reason why I include three and rather than one, this is a problem is that the course includes mathematics and not just engineering mechanics. If it was only engineering mechanics, I'm really, I really can only base, uh, base the whole course with a girl on the swing. I, I can base statics and the strings on that precise mini project. The problem is that the students also have to learn some linear algebra. So I just say, okay, I want something that has to do with linear algebra. So I devised this one here, where you have three rows, which is unusual, just it's two dimensions. And you can see that there are uh, the, uh, infinitely many solutions to the forces here, if you want to And that leads us to matrices. In this, in this part of the project, because I want them to learn why are matrices relevant? What do you mean by a system of equations have a consistent solution or many, many, or infinite number of solutions? So I, this one here is come because there is a part in the course which is called linear algebra. That's why it's here. So this is the idea. Uh, and so the semester project is about the design of equipment of student uh, children playground. So this is, uh, that's why if, if they have a different semester project, I would come up with different, with different, uh, with different projects I can base my course on. So I'm following their semester, like continuously, see what they are having, and then I base my course on that. Uh, it takes a lot of time, preparation time, more than usual preparation time uh, from time to time, you know, the usual lecture, it would be very, very easy for me to just do the same thing as the book says, and that's it. But the problem is that it takes so much time to do this, PBL, in the course. Okay. This one bit one disadvantage. Yeah, there's a, Ida has a question here. I guess, you know, in addition to the, the time aspect, uh, her question is when, when creating the PBL course, what, what do you see are the main challenges for the teacher and what are the gains? Uh, certainly time is a challenge, but what else? And, and what are the gains? And then- Yeah, the, the, gains, the gains are, the students, uh, the students are helped to learn by themselves and not just putting a formula on the blackboard. I mean, they know that now why they need this formula for deflection of beams, why it's relevant to learn just right now it's, 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 it's very important because they are doing something which they are interested in. They have chosen the course project. They have chosen the semester project. It's their interest. The design is their interest. It's not coming imposed on them it is their own world i am talking to so 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 what i so these are part of my remarks advantages and disadvantages of implementing the, uh, the course so of course as a lecturer you have to be a supervisor in the course itself you have to be a project supervisor you have to go from group to group and this is a different role than than before i mean before teacher just come for three hours and that's it. Thank you very much, we go. But now I have a, a different role besides being a lecturer. I have to, I have to go from Russia, what are they doing? How they are 
discussing things, I interfere and then I challenge them like, you know, uh, in a Socratic way, etc., uh, etc. Et so this is also a, a challenge for a teacher to implement PBL in a course. The teacher should have another role than just teaching. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, the problem is you have different backgrounds. You can't you just say, you just can't say that PBL is just one size that fits all. You have different groups, you have different student backgrounds. They come here for different reasons. Some of them does not, did not expect to have so much technical things. They just want to be designers, you know, innovative, and they are not that well uh, founded on, the, on technical uh, subjects. Others are. So the challenge is you have a mix of students where you have different expectations. I mean, if you talk about something called a didactical contract, in this course, you should need many didactical contracts, not just one between you and the whole class. You need contracts between you and the groups and sometimes individual students if this one to be, to be successful. So it can be done, but it takes so much time. And the course limitation is, is also a hindrance. So this is what my experience in implementing this. Okay. Ida, you had a second part to your question there. Do you, do you feel like it's been answered or would you like to ask that? Uh, no, I think actually uh, uh, I would like to, it, it's not been answered, but this somehow uh, I think it's good to make it explicit because here we are comparing uh, projects that has uh, 15 ECTS uh, and then we are looking into PBL at the course level. Uh, uh, and, and my question is actually related to, uh, in, uh, in relation to that. How is actually the difference between a PBL in a project uh, dimension, like 15 ECTS or two months time, and a, 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 a PBL course in a, in, a, in a five ECTS course? that is much more smaller in terms of time uh, in a semester. So, so here, my reflection is more in the sense of how do we actually look into the curricula? How do we actually look in how designing this both types of PBL environments? Because in one point, I think in that touches is actually the problem is much more narrow. The problem is, 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 is posed by EMAT, for example not necessarily found by the students or formulated by the students. So in terms of uh, two different settings as a course and a project with two different times and durations, how actually we should look into the PBL model and the teacher role per se. Yeah. Yes, the, the, stu the students, the students are just starting from the secondary school, you know, they are new, fresh students, and the, the project is not even chosen by themselves. I mean, it is the coordinators that have chosen the project, the semester project for them. And that's, and that's why I just followed that choice and made this course around the same thing about their semester project. And about the difference, the difference is, is the following. In PBL in a course, there is no uh, consistency, inconsistency, if you start by the class discussions for the whole class and not just the groups, because you should start somewhere. I mean, I should start introducing the course uh, somewhere. So that, that start is teacher-led discussions before they, before they giving the opportunity to act as a as, as groups, you know, I want to introduce what they are what they are expecting to come, what they are should working with, and, and to raise their interest in what I am talking about through this uh, class discussion. So maybe maybe this is a difference between the project base and and, and who said that it should be an open problem in the course. I have to abide by the curriculum. The course says I have to go through certain topics in mathematics and engineering mechanics and things of materials. So I have to design, I have to design my problems so that those topics are met. And, and of course, it's good that they are open. Why they are open? Because some students uh, have chosen 
a different kind of being here than other students. So it's not a close problem per se, but, but you can see, you can do statics on that. You can, you can see beam deflection on that, strings of material on that. You can see that you can, for example, choose that. For example, many students have come to the right idea why in Denmark they use steel for those uh, ropes. I mean, we can also use other material which is uh, more environmental friendly than uh, this one and still holds. And it's, it's, they have come to the idea it's still true. So it is not like religion that should be like uh, this way. They are allowed to change that design. They are, uh, but what I have gained as a teacher, that I have gained that they have, they have used the topics of the course and they are using it in the, in the right way, in a realistic way, instead of just uh, uh, textbook problems, which are, which are close form, they are close solutions. I mean, it's just like a mechanical, uh, mechanical calculation and that's it, they get a solution. But here they feel the solution and they know what they are doing. So this is what I think the difference is. Okay, Iman, in going with that, there's certainly value there in, in providing that for students, and I think, you know, to go with that, Mona's asked a good question here in the chat about time consumption. Uh, you spoke about it for the teacher or the instructor. Um, how about the time consumption for the students who uh, have these uh, mini projects and have multiple courses, you know, in, in, this, in this semester long project? So, and maybe Mona, do you want to elaborate on your question there a little bit more specifically? It's just that uh, given that I know that the students have three courses, all of which, each of, of which is the five ECT and they have a 15 ECTS uh, project, semester project. Now, if in your course you give them three mini projects, if they also get mini projects in the other courses, and we all know that by experience that students are more focused on projects uh, than they ra rather on lecturing. So, I'm a bit worried about whether the students get overloaded. My course is 10 points. This is 10 point course. What do you mean? Say again, Imad. Uh, it is a 10, 10 ECS point course, not five. Oh, it's a 10, I, 10 ECTS yeah. course. Yeah. Ah, yeah. okay, okay, okay. So we have uh, two times a week and we have uh, like 22, uh, 22 times in the whole semester. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. so of course you are right, if it's five points, it can't be done. But this course involves elements from statics, strings of materials, and mathematics. The whole is 10 points. Okay, so it's a, like a combined course yes. of mathematics and mechanics. Yes, so, but, yeah. that's what okay. I idea. The problem before is the following. Before there were three teachers on the course. One teacher for the mathematics part, he's, he's a mathematician, mm -hmm. not, not an engineer. The other two, one is coming from Alborg material section, and the other is coming from Alborg mechanics section. Yeah, yeah. They're also different departments. So, so that was a problem with the course before, three different teachers for that course, uh, for that course, and they were not coordinating. Uh, uh, okay. But now we have one teacher, and we can I can see that mathematics how can we be involved in the same course? I mean, this is the idea. Uh, it was a failure before. I think they say that. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Imad. Okay. Sorry, I was on mute. Kasim, do you mind just elaborating on your comment there a little bit? Because I think. They spoke into the challenge here in the, you know, the in the pandemic with the collaboration with teachers. But you speak a little bit about to the group work part. Would you, would you mind elaborating on that just a bit? Sure. Um, given now the current situation with COVID, um, I do a lot of group work, and it's online. Um, it's quite challenging, um, you know, monitoring those groups because my job is not as a tutor when I'm. Um, teaching concepts in a PBL-centered approach. My job is to facilitate and uh, make sure that they are in the right direction to address the problems and understand it. Um, it was very hard to actually monitor each group because I have about 25 students or 23 students in a classroom. And when you split them up into groups, um, 
it's quite challenging to intervene um, in an online environment. So um, the preparation, amount of preparation that it takes, um, like Imad mentioned here, is a lot of time from my end. I mean, on weekends, I just spend a lot of time trying to personalize um, and, you know, real life scenarios where students can engage in group work. Um, so it is quite challenging as well from our end here at Bahrain as well. I think Ahmad would agree with me as well in terms of how much time it takes to actually prepare, um, you know, those group works that the students need to do. That's pretty much for me. Okay. I don't know if Ahmad or any of your collaborators would like to elaborate on that. Otherwise, we could we could go to the kind of the closing comments here. I don't know if uh, my collaborators are here. I don't know if they want to say something. Hmm. Maybe just just a few words that uh, some years ago, me and another colleague, we, we did an investigation where we uh, asked some students actually about that. Do you spend more time on courses when they have a lot of mini projects than than when it's more? Uh, just, just normal course, uh, and, and they do, and it, it, it is, uh, because as uh, has been said before, students are much more motivated and engaged, but it, all, it's, it is time consuming. So I, I guess it, it's a balance, what you, what you should do when you have these hybrid uh, uh, BL models as, as we do, and it, you have a, a bit pragmatic, uh, pra pragmatism, I think, in, in some ways, and, um, and a, a fine a, a monitor and see, you don't want the students to be overloaded, but you also don't want them to be actually not learning things. So, I mean, so it's like finding a, a balance in that. So, um, and that that's hard uh, sometimes. And so, thank you. Okay. Well, I see we got a, uh, I, one I last like question. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, please yeah. do. Yeah, so, so I think that we should ask him perhaps also about the, so his workload as a teacher uh, and and so how you met how how is your experience with that I think you've done it a couple of times now um, and is it then you know so is it becoming more easy now where, when yeah. you've done it like, yeah so it's uh, it's it's becoming more like a regular course now or what yes uh, now I'm still doing the same I think in the course and. It will take very much this time from my part uh, because now I have experience in that, mm. uh, right? But the problem will come when they change my semester project. I have to redesign my course again. I mean, I mean, now they still because of the pandemic they still have the same project, uh, right? But next semester it will come a different project. Mm -hmm. So everything you see here will be totally different uh, when it, when we come to it, right? And that that will take time. Mm. That, this is will take time because when they change the project, I have to follow that. I have to react. I have to adapt, uh, right? And it takes so much time to um, uh, to prepare the, these cases. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are simply not textbook problems, you know. I mean, the book is full of problems, but it's not only the book you can learn from. You have to learn by hand. You have to learn from your own experiences. You have to go and measure. My students go and measure those things. The, some of them measure this angle for 60 and others 70 degrees. See, they are different. They can't cheat because they have different answers, uh, right? So the problem is, well, as I said, it will come again. I mean, if the same project, I have no problem with that. I know I have so much improvements after improvements. It's getting better and better, the PBL implementation. But when we come to another project, I have to start over again. I'm going to have to wrap things up here. I just want to thank Imad and Miriam. Um, thank you. Uh, let's just give them a virtual round of applause. I think they did a very nice job here today. And thank you to their collaborators who, who worked with them on this. Uh, it, this has been a great session. Uh, it's The time's gone by so quickly. I found it to be very valuable. And I think just want to, you know, just kind of bring back that, you know, some of the main messages here are around the importance of development for both the instructors or faculty members, you know, both on the methodologies around PBL, but it's also important to look at their motivation and their emotions. And the same is true for the students preparing them for the PBL learning environment as compared to the traditional things uh, that they may have experienced. And also 
I think as Deborah recognized, they're managing their emotions as they transition from what, you know, what is recognized as, as the right answer or their motivation to being a good student there. There's a lot to managing that transition. And I, I think we've highlighted on some of those things and I hope all of you at least took away some little small aspects of how you can uh, utilize this in your own uh, PBL programming, either that you have already, or as you, as you look to, to be active in the world of PBL. So I, I don't know if you want to close out with anything additional um, where we're going with IRS PBL, including this, this round and the, and the coming round, I'd like to leave a minute for you for that. Yes, thank you very much. And I think we also should give a round of applause to Bart <laughs> and for his moderation as well. Uh, it was very, very good. Um, we have sent the participants the links also to the next session that starts now at two. So feel free to join session three. That is a workshop on actually interdisciplinary uh, group work and across different countries. Uh, so that might be interesting and relevant for, for some of you. And we also have a session uh, number four. Um, that is actually the curriculum design and in PBL um, implementing a PBL approach. So, so we have two more. And uh, also there's uh, some news about the RSPBL uh, in August, 2021. So I strongly uh, recommend that you go to our website and see actually uh, what is being planned for the summer. Um, yes, now we are making the final decisions in terms of program and everything. Yes, and that's everything from me. So thank you very much for your participation as well. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye, Mary. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, and thank you, Maud, for your presentation. It was it was good. Ida, is there anything we want to do for a closeout at all or? Oh, you're still on mute. But... I will stop recording and then move okay. to, to the next session. Thank you very much, Bart. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought this was, uh, I mean, it was just such great dialogue. Sometimes we could shorten the time and then there's other